ከብራትና ከብራን ተመልካቾቻችን ደምላላችሁ ይህ የቲጂ ኢትዮጵያን ቴሌቪዥና ሬዲዮ ነው አዘጋጅና አቅራቢ መስብ በዘነኝ ተመልካቾቻችን አልማጮቻችን የቲጂ ኢትዮጵያን ሬዲዮ ዞትር ሁድ በዋሽንግተን ዲሲ ሳታቆጣጥር ከቀኑ 1 ፒኤም ጀምሮ በwerlp96.7 fm አርሊንተን ሬዲዮ ጣባላይና እንዲሁም በመላው ዓለም በኢንተርኔት ስርጭት www.wra.fm ላይ ይተላለፋል እንግዲህ ሁድን እየተበቃችሁ ይሄንን የቲጂ ኢትዮጵያ ሬዲዮን መራግብር እንድታዳምጡ ጋብዛለሁ ተመልካቾቻችን አልማጮቻችን ባለፈው ጊዜ HRS 128ን በተመለከተ ዝግጅት አቅርበ ነበር ይሄም HRS 128 በሃውስ በቮይስ ቮት ብቻ ከተላለፈ በኋላ ሴናተር ጄምስ ኢኖፍን ባነጋግረናቸው ጊዜ ይሄንን HRS 128 በተመለከተ በሴኔት ፍሎር እናገራለሁ በማለት እንዲ ብለው ነበር well, we'll be looking forward to speaking on the floor of the senate to clarify the, the wrong things and i hope that you will tell our friends in ethiopia that we are looking forward to that. ሴናተር ጀምሲኖፍም ባሉት መሰረትም ከጥቂት ቀናቶች በፊት በሴኔት ፍሎር ላይ ኢትዮጵያን በተመለከተ ታሪካዊ ንግግር አድርገዋል። ሴናተር ጀምሲኖፍም በሴኔት ፍሎር ላይ ንግግር በሚያደርጉበት ጊዜ በሀገራችን ውስጥ ስላለው የሰባዊ መብት ችግር እሰየው አላሉ። የኢትዮጵያ ችግር መፈታት የለበትም አላሉ። ትልቁ ነጥባቸው ለአዲስ ተቅላይ ሚኒስትር ጊዜ ሰጥዋቸው የሚል ነበር። ሴናተር ጀምሲን ሆፍ በሴኔት ፍሎር ላይ የተናገሩ ስለ ኢትዮጵያ ጥሩ ነገር ስለሆነ በእሳትም ሆነ በሌሎች የተቋም ሚዲያዎች ላይ አትሰሙት ሴናተር ኢንሆፍ በሴኔት ፍሎር ላይ ልክ እንደ ኮንግረስ ማን ስሚስ እንደሚያርጉት ንግግር ቢያደርጉ ኖሮ ያው የሴናተር ንግግር በተቋም ሚዲያዎች እንደጉድ ይነግርላቸው ነበር ለማንኛውም እንግዲህ ተቃዋሚዎች አስላለፉትም አላስላለፉትም እኛም ስለ ኢትዮጵያችን ጥሩ በተነገረ ቁጥር ያው ማስላልፋችን አይቀርም ሴናተር ጄምስ ኢንሆፍ አግራችን ኢትዮጵያን በተመለከተ በሴኔት ፍሎር ላይ ያደረጉትን ታሪካዊ ንግግር ያልሰማችሁ ካላችሁ እንድሰሙት ይጀላችሁ ቀርብ ያለው ተከታተሉት ሚስተር ፕሬዝዳንት አይ አይ ኖ ዘርስ ላት ኦፍ ኮምፒቲሽን ፎር ዘ ታይም ራይት ናው አንድ አይ ፊል ባድሊ ዘት I finally got to the point where in order to get the message out and I regret that it's a message that many people will think is not significant but I assure you this is of grave importance to not just a country but to an entire continent the continent of Africa uh, Mr President the House of Representatives recently just last week passed a House Resolution 128 to chastise one of our closest allies on the African continent that's Ethiopia. Although the legislation claims to support Ethiopia. The reality is that the resolution is outdated written years ago and blindly passed without consideration for the current situation in Ethiopia. It was also passed under a voice vote so that no one member of Congress would have to carry the stigma of being on record voting for it. I know that the house passed it because most of them have never been to Ethiopia and and don't really know the miracle that we've seen in that country but but I know the transformation uh Ethiopia has made in economic and social development along with their ongoing commitment to establishing security in the home horn of Africa since 2005 I've visited Ethiopia 18 different times engaging in developing relationships with prime ministers with cabinet ministers legislators businessmen aid workers and everyone else in between and there isn't another member of congress that has traveled in ethiopia and engaged with the ethiopian government and the ethiopian people more than i have and i say this for a reason and that is to show that i know something about ethiopia and i know we've been there before what is happening what happened last week happened before and people don't even know it so 
They passed a negative resolution on Ethiopia by voice vote. What the resolution fails to understand is the history of Ethiopia, so I want to talk about that. Now, Ethiopia is the oldest independent country in all of Africa, the oldest independent country, but one that is newly democratic. It's all new to them. The, uh, there's also a Christian history to the nation that nobody else has in the continent of, Ethiopia, uh, of, uh, of Africa. Ethiopia is featured in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, we hear about Philip. This is in Acts 8. Philip uh, running into the meeting, the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, on the, actually on the road to Damascus. Uh, the eunuch, uh, we find out later, was actually the treasurer of the country of Ethiopia at that time. And Philip told the eunuch about Jesus. And he talked about the Old Testament where the Queen of Sheba and Solomon, uh, there are uh, over 50 of these mentions in the Bible. And, and they had a long conversation. It was all about Jesus. And this was, the, this was uh, the Philip who was making these comments. And he, uh, before the conversation was over, he baptized the eunuch and he went off to Ethiopia and was the first, the, the eunuch took the first word of Jesus to Ethiopia. That's very significant. Now, the second thing that uh, happened was the Queen of Sheba. Coincidentally, uh, while well, Addis is the capital of Ethiopia, uh, there was a time when, the, uh, when Aksum was the capital. That was many, many years ago. But at the time of the Queen of Sheba, that was the capital of Ethiopia. And uh, coincidentally, I happened to be uh, in Ethiopia when a farmer in the field uh, ran into some old relics and uh, they started excavating and they found out that was the palace of the Queen of Sheba. So that was something that that time, there's been a discussion as to whether or not the Queen of Sheba was actually from Yemen or from, from uh, Ethiopia, but that was the concrete proof. They have discovered that that was the case. Now, the story goes on and on and, and we all know about uh, the, uh, about the Queen of Sheba, hearing about Solomon. Solomon had all the wealth in the world and she wanted to meet Solomon and down to the, the lake she or down to the Red Sea. She went and uh, went to see Solomon. Well, she got to uh, uh, Israel and she met Solomon and they were engaged very closely together. And uh, I think we all know that they ended up having a son who came back to this country. By the way, the part of the, of the Old Testament that I'm quoting right now is in 1 Kings 10, verse 1. Uh, and that's about the trip between Israel and Ethiopia. And they, they had a boy. And the boy was Menelik. He, uh, uh, he was one who was a very smart person. And he was the one who, as he was growing up in years before returning to their home country in Ethiopia, he actually took the Ark of the Covenant back to Ethiopia, where it is today in Aksum. Now, a lot of people don't know that. If anyone questions what I'm saying right now, there's a book that was written. It was called The, the Sign in the Seal by Graham Hancock. And it's very well documented. And when you read that, you come to the conclusion that that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. And I know that because I've been to the Ark of the Covenant with many members of the Senate here, uh, certainly uh, Senator Bozeman from uh, Arkansas, Senator um, uh, Mike Enzi from Wyoming, and many others. We've uh, been together, uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Mike Rounds from South Dakota, and we've been up there and we've actually seen this, where this is taking place. So I say this because there is that very rich history, and it's all documented in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, the current controversy and why we're here today started back in the 1970s with a man named Mengistu. From, uh, from 1974 to 1991, Mengistu was the leader of the Communist Derg. Now, this is the controlling party at that time as a Communist Party. They ran Ethiopia. And... Uh, it was a terrible time for Ethiopia. That was during one of the, the worst uh, famines that they've had. It killed over a million people, perhaps the most significant famine in, in history in terms of deaths. Many Ethiopians fled during that time and relocated in the United States. Well, that's understandable. 
because the, the, the communists were booted out and, uh, and, and of course, they, they, a lot of the people during the time they were still in came to the United States. It's interesting because the Ethiopians are very outstanding people. They're the kind, they get things done when other people don't and that's what makes them different from all the other countries in, in, uh, in Africa. So a lot of these Ethiopians came to the America and they have made great, really remarkable uh, uh, contributions to America, building organizations, getting involved. Uh, they rightfully so were outspoken against the brutal regime, but they haven't changed their outspokenness to reflect the changing conditions in Ethiopia. The, uh, because when the, the time that this took place, when the uh, one person who is responsible in a large sense to getting rid of, of, the, of the communists and the communist drug in Ethiopia was a guy named Mellis. And he, was, he, he, he ran and he came from the bush and he won and he ended up uh, a prime minister. And this, this is really the election that a lot of the people don't like and they forget about the fact that he was the prime minister who actually got rid of the communists in uh, Ethiopia. So he became a, a prime minister and he started to build democracy. Uh, now he died in 2012. And I, I got to know him quite well during that time frame, and I saw the progress that he made and the advances that they made. Uh, in the, but he was replaced then by uh, another uh, prime minister whose name is Haile Miriam. Now, he became prime minister and he continued to push for democracy. Haile Miriam worked diligently to improve things. Under his tenure, the Ethiopia established the independent Ethiopian Human Rights Committee to report on violence and human rights um, problems and abuses. But they didn't just establish it, they acted on it. And they came out with a report and acted on it to hold perpetrators accountable and make improve, uh, to make the improvements that are being made. And our relationship wasn't just government to government, it was brother to brother. You know, in February of 2017, Prime Minister Haley, uh, Haley Miriam, Haley Miriam suggested that all, since they're all fighting at that time, there are nine provinces in, in Ethiopia. Each province has a governor. So he suggested, we suggested on the phone with the members of the Senate here and of the House Prayer Breakfast, you know what we ought to do? We ought to follow the recommendation of Eisenhower who said, uh, back this is right after World War II, he said, you know, the problems of this world are so great that we'll never resolve the problems until we learn to sit down and pray together. So we decided, let's get all the governors, let's get the prime minister, let's get the members of the House, members of the Senate, and the prime minister and the rest together, and we'll pray for them. Well, the problem was, we did this. In fact, uh, several, I had five senators with me at that time, and we went over, and, and the, the problem was only two governors showed up. So eight months later, we came back, and put together the same thing and talk to them to let them know what this is all about. And it happened eight months later. And we're just talking about it just, just recently. We had nine governors who had been fighting with Haile uh, Miriam all together and we prayed all together. Now, at the same time, there's a congressman, Randy Haldgren, uh, over in the House, who it happens to be the chairman of the House Prayer Breakfast. And so he got, uh, and the time change worked perfectly. At the time we were praying there, then you take the seven hours differential. They were meeting the house, house prayer breakfast here in, in uh, Washington. So he joined in. Now, I'm not smart enough to figure out how they do this. It's some kind of a thing called Skype where you can get uh, on TV and communicate. So they were praying over there with all these house members at the same time that we were praying. And on top of that, we had a bunch of the great pages, like the pages sitting right in front of you today, all praying at the same time. This was going on all over America. And so they all got together and it worked. This, this same group of people who had just hated each other, who had never been in the same room before, and the prime minister, all and, and all of us, the members of the Senate and others who were there, were, uh, were all uh, rejoicing and were embracing each other. So the majority of the people didn't, it's, it, because it's different in Ethiopia, most of the people don't live in cities, and, and that made this that much more difficult because 
that's the reverse of the rest of the world. The vast majority of people in, uh, live there in rural communities, making widespread change and development a long, longer and more difficult path. In Ethiopia, the tribal factions also play a greater role. Now, anyone who's been there understands this. Uh, if you go from province to province, that used to be from tribe to tribe. And uh, they have historically not gotten along until this time. And so it made it more difficult because of the factions and all of that, but it worked. And we unified them together, and that was unlike anything that's ever happened there. So earlier this month, Ethiopia took another step to showing their commitment to a free and fair democracy by selecting a new prime minister. And who is this? His name was Abiy Ahmed, a doctor, a medical doctor, a doctor. In, in fact, it's kind of interesting. You, if you think about his credentials, just listen to this, Mr. President. He, Abi received his first degree, a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the Microlink Information Techno Technology College in Addis. That was in 2001. In 2005, uh, Abu, uh, Abi uh, earned a postgraduate certificate in the cryptology uh, uh, degree in South Africa. He holds a Master's of Arts in the Transformational Leadership and Change with Merit, earned at the Business School in Greenwich University in London, and in collaboration with the International Leadership Institute uh, in, in Addis. In 2011, he holds a Master of Business Administration and the one from the Landstar College of Management and Leadership in Addis and in partnership with the Ashland University in Ohio. In 2017, Abi was awarded a PhD from the Institute for Peace and Security Studies from Addis University. Now, we haven't studied all the way through, but we did. We took a cursory look at that, and we believe he is the most highly educated prime minister in the history of the continent. Now, so there we are with this Dr. Abi, who has been specially selected uh, for this committee to uh, to democracy, to good governments, and the rule of law. I met Abi for the first time in February of 2016 at a leader's breakfast where he told the story of his journey in faith in Jesus. Uh, he, very, very articulate, something that no one would forget about. We met again a year later where we prayed and talked about how to unify the country in peace, not conflict. It is from these meetings that I know Abi is committed to democracy and committed to the future of Ethiopia. He's showing that with his actions as well. Uh, last week, he specifically sought to engage the opposition party and its leaders. He said, and this is a quote, he said, we want to work hand in hand with you. What we say and do must match. And since his inauguration, he's also restored the internet service or all across the, 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 uh, the country and he's released 11 high profile dissidents. And this is what we need to be encouraging not delegitimizing as his authority with a heavy-handed resolution. After his first week in office, this, this giant, this first week in office, they passed this resolution, this hateful resolution over in the House. And he is also the youngest head of state in all of Africa. Uh, uh, Abi is just 41 years old. It shows an optimistic and engaged future for Ethiopia, a country where 70% of the population is less than 35 years old. He deserves a chance to enact the democratic reforms he called for during his inaugural address before getting slapped with a condemnation uh, of his government by the House of Representatives resolution. And they have quite an opportunity. Ethiopia is one of the fastest growing economies in the region and has made great strides in lowering the poverty rate. But the resolution that uh, passed last week they did, that wasn't what this is about. They didn't, they didn't do it. Everything that I just articulated. Ethiopia is also an important partner for us in promoting regional peace and security. He's been our partner. We've, seen, we've all seen recently how Islamic terrorists are pushing from the Middle East, are regrouping and establish themselves across Africa. This is the thing that he inherited, he's, the mess that he's in right now. Ethiopia has been an important partner for the United States in combating the spread of terrorism from Somalia and Al-Qaeda. Uh, he's our closest partner in this effort. As terrorism grows through Djibouti 
in the Horn of Africa into northeastern Africa. This is a threat to global security. And Ethiopia has been a critical partner for the United States in combating the, that spread of terrorism. Ethiopia is uh, the top African contributor to UN peacekeeping troops and it supplies about 8% of the global peacekeeping force. Not the second or among the first, he was number one, the first one to uh, be a contributor to the UN peacekeeping effort. That's the contributions that they've made. Other countries have not done that, but they have. But more than that, Ethiopia's professional and capable military has also been a positive force in regional stability. You know, when we had problems in parts of Africa and uh, uh, Somalia comes to mind right now. Uh, it's when we call upon them to send troops, they're the first ones to respond and they are the ones who send the most of their capable troops. Uh, Ethiopia has a regional stabilizer during a crisis, uh, a crisis with Sudan in, in South Sudan. I think we all remember when Sudan was one unified country and they'd always not gotten along with South Sudan. South Sudan's been trying to get their independence for years and years, and finally they're successful. So South uh, Sudan, uh, and, and that, right after that, it looked like it wasn't gonna work. But the resolution last week didn't consider any of the progress Ethiopia uh, has made and in, in, in the leadership they pr provided. Beyond just the government, more good things are happening in Ethiopia than I've ever seen. The people, are not just like other people. It's, uh, it's, 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 there's not time today. I could give so many examples. I want to single out just one family that is really typical of what's going on in Ethiopia. We have longtime friends there. Uh, their names are Marta Gaber uh, Tosdik and her husband, Demi Tekliwald. I'll refer to them as Marta and Demi. Uh, they founded a thing called Project Mercy. This is kind of interesting because this wasn't government. This is what they have done and what they have, are, are trying to do uh, to, uh, in their country. And uh, by the way, it's kind of interesting because Marta, as a very young girl, went to work for Haile Selassie. We all know Haile Selassie, that what a hero he was before they came in in 1974 and uh, the, the communists came in and, not, and, and murdered him and, and uh, took over the country. But Marta actually had worked for him at one time. They received political asylum in the United States uh, in the early uh, 1970s after the communist takeover in Ethiopia, only to return to their country to care for, as they say, the least of these. And that's what they've been doing. You know, Marta wrote a book. It should be required reading so people know the sacrifices that people make to escape communism. The name of her book was Sheltered by the King. In fact, if you guys want a copy of it, I'll give it to you. They, uh, and it tells the story about the communist takeover when Haile Selassie was murdered. It's about their escape from communism. And throughout the years, I've partnered with uh, Marta and Demi on several occasions. In 2008, I worked with the USAID. At that time, we had a guy that unfortunately wasn't able to stay there very long as head of the USAID. But uh, they, they prioritized the shipment at that time of 34 containers of APMET. This is during a time when, of starvation, and this is a nutritional supplement that was sent to, uh, to those in the most severe stages of starvation to young children. Ethiopia was especially hit hard on the global, eco global economic crisis, and these containers equaled 600 tons of food to feed 27,000 severely malnourished children. The story of, uh, uh, of Marta and Demi is, is kind of interesting because they started out in Addis, that's the, the capital, and they started out with a small, a small house, getting three or four young men, boys, uneducated, and taught them the scriptures, taught them how to read and write, taught them all these things, and then how to put together a, an economy and get these people so they can go out on their own. And so they were successful. And they, that grew from three people to six people to 100 people. And, and they, then they went down to a part, of, a part of Africa, a part of Ethiopia that's really interesting. It's called Yadabon. Yadabon is interesting because uh, it's an area where there wasn't any civilization there. It was in the bush on the side of a mountain. And they, they, and I went down to Yadamon to see, this is some time ago, and was thrilled that Raj Shaw, he was the administrator of the USAID. And he at that time was said, 
he accepted my invitation to go down there with us to Yadamon and, uh, and, and, pro and just see what they have done down there. And when you stop and look in that remote area, the two of them alone, it's not just a matter of 10 or 12 or 100 kids. 1,700 kids were all lined up, K through 12, smiling, big smiles. Their lives have been changed. And all that took place down there. I, <laughs> I remember when there was a, a terrible storm down there as we were leaving, and it was uh, uh, all muddy, and I told Raj, anyone under age 70, get out and push, and I was the only one exempted, of course. Uh, anyway, uh, he saw the significance of what resourcefulness of the, of the Ethiopian people and the progress the country has made in furthering democracy and stabilizing the region. USAID, by the way, is now headed up with another person who loves Africa, and his uh, Mark Green. I remember Mark Green. He used to be the ambassador to uh, Tanzania. A close friend of mine actually served with him at one time back in the in the house, and uh, he recognized the genius of the Ethiopian people. And we we're privileged to, to deliver uh, a bunch of uh, another program we had put together. They had put together where they would cross breed. Uh, breed cows and put them, uh, start dairy farms in an area close to, uh, to, to Addis. Anyway, it has been very successful the programs. And you keep in mind, this is all a result of one family. And I could give examples of this all over the, the country in Ethiopia. The technical ex uh, assistance and training to improve the products that they had were done all by one family. And all that was Marta and Demi. Well, there's another thing that they've said. There's another person who is, uh, is, sets them aside from other countries in Africa. That's the, uh, it was a doctor named Hamlin. She actually started the Fistula Hospital. A fistula is a disease that people who are pregnant have, and uh, it is fatal in many cases. It's very unique to that part of Africa. And so they have uh, an organization working alongside the Ethiopian government to provide sustainable solutions to the Amula, uh, uh, Hamlin uh, Festula Hospital. It's, a, it's, a, it's been a haven for the care for women. And all this, one person started this. This is the character of the people. They started treating women in, in uh, Ethiopia's busy capital city of Addis since 1959 and has now grown to an additional five regional hospitals, a midwifery college, a rehabilitation center, longtime patients. And I, you know, my wife Kay and uh, visited the hospital along with Senator Enzi's wife Diane and Senator Bozeman's wife Kathy and saw the miracle that's taking place there, all because of one woman that is typical of the people that you find in Ethiopia. And so they saw the impact that the hospital is making on the lives of women throughout the country and, they, and able to deliver their babies safely and to be treated with dignity for childbirth inju injuries. So much of the development and progress is due to the emergence of past and present African leaders like recently sworn in Prime Minister Dr. Uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed who is, are investing in lives of their people and uh, the realization of the United States as a strategic importance uh, to Africa. They are important to us. They've joined us in every effort, every military effort that we've had more than any other country. But then, none of that was considered by the House last week when they passed this, this uh, short-sighted resolution. I tried to work with key sponsors of the resolution to make needed changes to reflect the facts in Ethiopia's progress, but uh, my efforts were unsuccessful. Uh, they, they wouldn't listen to me, and we can't, still can't figure out why it is that a handful of people who have probably never, ever been to Ethiopia were doing this to that country. The resolution made a lot of blanket claims. Uh, they said uh, democratic space in Ethiopia has steadily diminished since the general elections of 2005, and that the ruling party claimed 100% of the parliamentary seats in the 2015 elections continued insults to our close friends in, in, uh, in Africa. But the d democratic space in Ethiopia has never been more vibrant, as the numbers speak for themselves. There are more uh, uh, opposition candidates in the 2015 election than there have ever been in any, any election in the history of Ethiopia. In 2015, the African Union observers they were the ones that were there observing the election. They concluded that the elections had been free, peaceful, and credible, and had provided an opportunity for the 
the Ethiopian people to express their choices at the polls. Overall, the AU observers offered conclusions and recommendations to the government, the election, electoral board, the political parties, and to the media to strengthen that process, and that's been successful. The resolution inaccurately stated that the ruling party claimed to have won 100% of the parliamentary seats. Not true at all, no truth at all. And in fact, that is not a ruling party. The BPRDF is not one party. It's a coalition of four major political parties with proportional representation from four regions, namely Oromaya and Hamran and some other of the other uh, southern uh, 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 nations. The resolution also claimed that peaceful protests were often hijacked by violent events. Well, last year, there were protests and demonstrations in parts of Oromia and, uh, and uh, uh, Hamara in that region, and it did grow violent. And you, uh, Ethiopia has the duty to ensure law and order like any other country, and that's exactly what they did. The government of Ethiopia openly acknowledged that uh, people have legitimate grievances and expressed its willingness to address those. They are making strides. The second National Human Rights Action Plan the, the current ruling party has embarked on a dialogue with 22 opposition parties. The U.S. should allow this dialogue to continue free of interference. This resolution wasn't new. The House of Representatives did this in, 19, in 2007 also. And by the way, they also did this by voice vote there because no one wanted to be tied to something that they had to vote on uh, without really knowing what it was all about. And so that they did it in, in uh, 2007. And I don't think the outcome of that was ever discussed, so I'm going to tell the story now. In 2007, in that resolution, they claimed that its purpose was to, quote, encourage and facilitate the consolidation of peace and security in Ethiopia, but in reality, it focused only on the shortcomings while blatantly ignoring the unprecedented progress that the country had made. I went to Ethiopia three weeks after the House voted in 2007. The resolution was reported widely for weeks in Ethiopia press as the United States sharply criticized at that time Ethiopia, same as they did last week. It caused great confusion and anger with the Ethiopian people who were emerging from communist rule. You know, you could argue that at the time that this happened, the people who were protesting the current uh, or the, the, the uh, administration under uh, Prime Minister Me uh, Meli, probably they're saying that they preferred the communists in there. This is some because he was responsible for changing all that. So they had that resolution. It was reported, it, it hurt them, it hurt their reputation around the world. It caused great confusion and anger with the Ethiopian people who were emerging from a communist rule and working with democracy. Uh, I met with Prime Minister Mellis on that trip, and he said that the House vote really hurt our relationship with Ethiopia. I remember exactly what he said to me. He said, our survival depends on democratization. Uh, he also opened the, and the, uh, was uh, open and honest about the problems that they had in the 2005 election. He acknowledged the riots that uh, better uh, training could have prevented the deaths of some seven policemen. It's not the story that you hear. You hear about thousands, hundreds of people dying. That's simply not the case. So Prime Minister Mellis also noted that they were being singled out for criticism and sanctions when Eritrea, an autocratic government that openly gave refuge to terrorists, faced no such condemnation. He stated that he felt insulted by the bill as well he should have. When I was visiting with Azeb, that is uh, Melis' wife, and by the way, Azeb and Melis fought together in the, in the coup that took over the country from communism uh, in the bush. And uh, when she asked me how the United States could attack our friends in this way, I didn't have an answer for that. And, and remember, we are friends. Ethiopia has been a partner in the global war on terror and has contributed troops to peacekeeping missions and supported regional security efforts. We also met with a group of American Ethiopian citizens in Addis who had returned to Ethiopia to invest and rebuild the nation. They had returned in the mid-2000s because it was the first time that they had confidence in the government to return, and it did. They were very frustrated and disappointed by the resolution. 
Today, I'm sure that Prime Minister uh, Abiy and the Ethiopian people are also confused and frustrated by this resolution. And I want to speak now to our friends in Ethiopia who may be feeling abandoned by the, the United States and questioning our partnership and friendship in such a critical part of the world. This resolution, while offensive to you, does not change your friendship with the United States. I want to repeat that. I want to make sure that people know that, that the resolution, while it is offensive to you, doesn't change our friendship in the United Nations. We have a long history of economic and military cooperation that will continue, and Ethiopia is only gaining momentum as a nation. This is apparent when you look at Ethiopia's economy, their military, and their U.S.-Ethiopia uh, 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 trade relationship they're now building with our country. Ethiopia ranks, ranks among the fastest growing economies in the world. Despite the, this is significant, despite the recent drought, the IMF estimates that Ethiopia will have an average GDP growth rate of 7.4 percent from 2017 to 2020. Now, this is what I would have said yesterday, but something happened yesterday. I wouldn't, didn't know it was going to happen. Yesterday, at the latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF announced that Ghana had lost its position as the fastest growing economy in Africa, and they lost it to who? To Ethiopia. Ethiopia now is the fastest growth uh, in, uh, of 8.5%. Of we in the United States would love to have an 8.5% economic growth. So total U.S. Uh, direct investment, uh, including uh, partnerships, stands at more than $567 million, with more than $65 million originating solely from the United States. The United States has a positive trade balance with Ethiopia, particularly in manufacturing, energy, and agricultural processing. Over the past 70 years, Ethiopian Airlines has purchased more than 100 uh, U.S. Or, uh, origin uh, aircraft. Uh, in 2016 alone, Ethiopia utilized over $149 million worth of U.S. agricultural products, including wheat, coffee, and oil seeds. The U.S. continues to provide assistance in supporting Ethiopia's agricultural development. Through the USDA, the three-year $13 million Food for Progress program, known as Feed Project, helps to improve yields of milk, meat, uh, eggs, and other products by increasing the availability and quality of, of livestock feed. And the, the, the United States International Military Education Program, by the way, that's called IMET. The IMET program was put together many years ago so that when we, our troops go into other areas, uh, that they mingle with the, the troops there. And then we invite the troops from various countries to come into the United States and get your training here. And we found out that once the training takes place in this country, we have their allegiance for the rest of the time they're there. Well, they've been working to train future leaders here in the United States and, and uh, create a rapport between the United States and the Ethiopian military. And they had over 600 members from 2010 to 2015 one of our most successful IMET programs, working military to military. Along with their own successes, Ethiopia has established themselves as a world player. Ethiopia and the United States belong to a number of the same international organizations, including the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and, world, and the World Bank. The nation is an observer to the World Trade Organization, is currently serving on the United Nations Security Council as a non-permanent member. So I say to my colleagues in the Senate, I would like to remind you that with the passing of the resolution 128, we are repeating the past as exactly what they did uh, back a few years ago. That doesn't mean though that we have to do it again in the future. Ethiopia is a key friend uh, and Prime Minister Abbott, just keep in mind, here's a guy who's the highest, highest educated Prime Minister, we think in the entire history of the entire continent of Africa. And he deserves a chance for a strong start. I'll continue to fight for that friendship in Congress, and I urge the United States to give them a chance, the chance that they rightfully earned. Clearly, the resolution 128 does not reflect the Americans, America's relationship with Ethiopia, one of our most valued allies in all of Africa. And are you listening? I ask my brother, Prime Minister Abby, America is with you. America is with you.
ክብራስና ክብራን አድማጮቻችን ተመልካቾቻችን ስለ ተከታተላችሁ አመሰግናለሁ የቲጂ ኢትዮጵያን ሬዲዮ ሁድሁድ በ WERALP 96.7 FM ሬዲዮ ጣቢያ ላይ እና እንዲሁም በመላው ዓለም በኢንተርኔት ስርጭት በ www.wra.fm ድረገጽ ላይ ይተላለፋል ሁድሁድ በሬዲዮ እንድታዳምጡን ታብዛለሁ በድጋሚ ስለ ተከታተላችሁ አመሰግናለሁ ይህ የቲጂ ኢትዮጵያን ቴሌቪዥን እና ሬዲዮ ነው አዘጋጅና ቀራይ መስበዙ ነኝ ደናሁን ሁሌ Thank <laughs> you.